We played our first concert in uh, 2004 at, uh, in New York City at Merkin Concert Hall. Uh, it was a concert that was, I believe, programmed by a composer named Annie Gosfield, um, who we've worked with individually in, in other groups uh, prior to that. And she wrote us a piece called Wild Pitch, which was uh, inspired by the Red Sox winning the World Series in 2004. Um, and from that point on, um, I think we kind of decided to see if we can um, make anything happen with this particular combination of instruments in this group. So that's from then on, it just kind of, um, yeah, we started up started commissioning more composers and um, and started playing more concerts and and I mean it's, it's that was only three yeah, years ago. It's, it's a pretty a, young group. Yeah, that was, you know, wasn't even three so, years ago, you know. So, so but in those th within those three years a lot of we commissioned probably about what probably yeah, close to ten pieces. Ten pieces. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. um it's moving quite quickly. Yeah. And um, being out here is nice that we know we'll be here for the next four years or three years playing, you know, premiering new pieces, so. I think maybe the choice of the in instrumentation uh, would uh, show the love of new work because there is only a few pieces uh, written for this combination. And um, there was one other group in, uh, where were they, in Minneapolis or? I forget I where, they, where they were based. Yeah, which is the same instrumentation. So they had a, a few pieces written for them. And that, was about, that was about 30 years ago, right? No, no, no. no there was, was like the last oh, decade or so. Oh, yeah. Right. And, um, so yeah, because of the not having um, so much repertoire, uh, we, we have to commission. And it's um, also there's certain pieces that are open instrumentation that we can play. But besides that, you know, it's definitely um, the commissioning part is a big point of the group. Well, we all play a lot of contemporary music, and because of that, we are constantly meeting and playing new works by by living composers. So from there, we um, I mean, every, each case is different, but uh, we talk about who we would who we think might be able to write us a good piece, um, and. Uh, it's actually interesting because there is no real uh, set repertoire for this combination. The pieces that we've been getting have all been quite drastically different. I think partly because um, the fact that David plays a lot of, not only does he play a lot of the mallet instruments, but he plays also drum kit as well. So that um, there's a lot of percussionists out there that don't play, I mean, they play the drum kit, but don't really play the drum kit, you know, so that's kind of opened up um, a lot of possibilities uh, for our commissions. I mean, it's interesting because the, the cello and the piano are quite set, you know, I mean, we can amplify ourselves, or Felix can play an electric cello, or we could use a keyboard and, you know, use um, samples, or, you know, other, there's other sound worlds that we can get into with those two instruments. Um, but with percussion, it's really, it's probably one of the more difficult instruments to write for just because it's so vast, like what is percussion and, you know, what that constitutes. And um, so with, so far with the commissions we've gotten, um, they're using standard standard instruments, um, mallet instruments, a vibraphone or marimba, and, and then some other, other, other things, and then sometimes some found instruments or instruments that I select, you know, they leave it a little more open. Um, but even in the case of the piece we're, we're playing here, Mark Nykert's piece, um, he wrote for, for instruments that um, really just changed the sound world very quickly. Um, these um, singing bowls from, from uh, Tibet or China where you, you're rubbing it like a, um, like a wine glass, it's the, the same concept. So it, it just creates this this texture that um, you know you wouldn't just get with the standard instruments. So and and I think in general composers uh, 
when they have that opportunity to write, they they grab they grab that pretty pretty hard and and uh, get into a whole whole other thing, you know. So it's um yeah, it's pretty interesting. And then the way just having this this combination, the piano is a percussion instrument, so you know it's really that rhythmic side of it and uh, just the kind of color that we can get is pretty interesting. And then the cello can kind of fit really nicely in there because you have these two instruments with a real strong attack. So it actually works out pretty well. You know, it's, um, like what Felix was saying, it's pretty impressive to see how different all the pieces have been so far. Not just stylistically, but just really, um, pretty much every piece sounds like a different group is playing because the, the, the way the sound world changes so much. So it's, um, it's a nice combination. Uh, ritual is, well, it's really a difficult piece to describe, I think, because the influences on the music are, I think, probably a bit more esoteric than um, what maybe a lot of listeners will bring into the experience of hearing it the first time. There's definitely these sorts of, um, like Dave was talking about, the, the percussion textures that the singing bowls, uh, or prayer bowls, is that what they're mm -hmm. called, that the prayer bowls generate. Um, you're getting into, you know, types of sound worlds that are maybe more associated with, uh, you know, certain contemporary composers whose music might be less known. But also, um, I mean, I guess with the title "Ritual," he must be trying to evoke ideas of, you know, types of uh, atmospheres and rhythms that you would associate with different types of rituals. So there are parts of it that are really meditative, um, that might be looked at as um, something a little more, maybe going for something a little more spiritual in nature, and then there are parts that are clearly rhythmic, almost like, um, you know, some type of a dance that somebody might might do at a ritual, I suppose. So there's, um, but all these references, it's nothing really direct. You don't hear it and think, oh, that sounds like an African kind of tune, the rhythm and the melody, and everything's very hard to describe. That's probably what makes the piece most interesting, that um, you can't, Gra I mean, we could say Petrushka is kind of a ritual piece in a way. It uses a lot of these sort of folk dances and things from the sort of a rite of spring. I mean, that's more more actually what I mean. Um, you can hear these dances, and, and they have this sort of a Slavic kind of a character. These the sorts of tunes and rhythms that come out in this piece. I think they're they're pretty hard to just characterize right away. So, kind of influenced by the not direct quotes. Yeah, yeah, but I, they're not direct quotes, and even the influences are very, like, it's not really too much of this or too much of that. You can see a little bit what influenced him, but it's not, you don't feel any direct hits there, like he took that from so-and-so. You know, you hear some people's music, and you can tell, wow, that person really likes Shostakovich, or that person really likes Debussy, or what, just the way their harmony moves, or the types of colors they're attracted to. But uh, I think in this piece, it's really hard to pin down, you know, where it comes from. It's a pretty individual effort, I think. Well, it's, uh, it's, you can hear the surroundings where he, that, that, that was, I imagine the surra he, he wrote it in Santa Fe where he lives, and he lives out, his studio is out in the, kind of the, you know, the desert a little bit outside of town a little bit, so you can, it's yeah. a pretty serene, esoteric area, part of the world, so you can, Mountains in the yeah, you can hear it in the music a little bit. Uh, and also, it's very much Mark's style of writing. You know, it's, it sounds like Mark Nykerk wrote it. You know. but the, one of the unique things of the piece, it starts with all three of us playing percussion. So, and that's the sort of like this ritualistic idea that he wanted to go for, at least with the opening. But it's not like drummy. You know, it's uh, these bowls and uh, all all uh, sustaining metallic sounds, and gongs and um, vibraphone and. Um, these uh, antique symbols, you know. So it's um, right there. He's already setting up, you know, something quite different. And then, and then these two move to their instruments after a while. As far as like you know, the, the history of piano and cello in Western classical music is going to go yeah, much further back. So, so I, you know, you guys do a lot more of that stuff. But um, there's, I think, just if you're working with older music, uh, there's a history of performance, and you know I think that becomes really strong, of like how other people did it, and you learn. Part of the learning process is learning how people approach that music, 
And with this, I mean, you have that background, but, but you know, with this, it's, um, it's really f right there for you to, to put your mark on it first, you know, and you're having something fresh like that. It's, um, it's really exciting, you know. And, and in fact, like with Mark's piece, he wanted to write for all these pitched gongs and, and bowls and things, and I had to record the instruments that I had and, you know, send him files, and uh, he chose which ones he wanted to write, what pitches that would work well, and I have to bring those specific instruments with me for the, for the piece. So it's really, um, you know, fine-tuned for, for this group, and, and you have a little more of a sense of ownership of, or being part of that, you know, experience with, with a piece like that. So um, that's the biggest difference, is just sort of for me that the history doesn't exist <coughs> of um, performers playing this piece before, before you've done it. Or, I mean, the performance practice exists, but you're not, you don't have, you know, a hundred other people who played it before you, who've recorded it, who, yeah, like yeah. their teachers, who taught it to other people, who taught it to you, who taught it, you know, it doesn't go through that lineage. That lineage. We so were just talking today about how um, Felix and David had heard about some performances this summer of pieces that we'd commissioned for our group, but other groups playing those pieces, and we thought it was kind of funny because, you know, we've only been around not even three years, and so it's interesting to see how the repertoire that you've been in involved in, in bringing to creation um, starts to take on a life of its own. You know, now there's going to be other groups playing it, uh, these pieces, and, uh, and which is good, you know. Um, but, you know, like Dave was saying, it's interesting to be the people who did play it first, who kind of, you know, made the first recording, gave the first performances, uh, especially for pieces that end up still being played well beyond the time that we'll be alive. Uh, and you never know which ones those are going to be, you know. <laughs> so that's, that's maybe interesting, just to be involved on the very front end of something that could go on for a, a long time, possibly. Beethoven's music was first being played, there were people going into the, the, the hall for, you know, a certain type of listening experience and coming out, you know, a little surprised and shocked. I mean, his music now doesn't sound all that outrageous to us. I mean, some of the modern, or the, the late works still sound very modern to our ears today, which is kind of a testament to some of the stuff he was doing in the mid-19th century and um, that uh, early 19th century, you know, that people even now can hear that music is sounding very modern. Um, and so, you know, that's always, I think, been the case. There, there's this kind of bridge between generations where you have maybe older generations expecting type of listening experience that they grew accustomed to at a certain point in their life, and then the styles keep evolving. I mean, now guys like us are involved in types of music that are much closer to the sort of uh, pop and rock music that we grew up with and the kind of jazz that's out there in clubs now, much more so than people who play contemporary music that are like 20, 30 years older than us, that are probably a little more tied to the academic, uh, traditional contemporary music that comes from, you know, out of that direct line, you know, going back through, you know, Bartok and Stravinsky and these guys all the way back. You know, a lot of the stuff we're playing is, is I think the, the genesis of, of uh, the composer's idea is often coming from a point of view of, you know, someone who grew up listening to Pink Floyd and um, grew up listening to all kinds of different music. So even the new music we play, I think sometimes, you know, it's not for everyone. It's for people that are into that kind of thing. But people who want like a sort of 12 tonish ish angst-ridden, you know, kind of piece, um, that's not always what you're going to get with us. Some of our pieces are more chamber music-y, and then a lot of them are more like, almost sounds like a band, so without a singer. Hey, you'd be surprised. I was at a concert where a guy, um, it was a jazz show, and there were, you know, your sort of, what you would consider, you know, your typical concert patrons on the retired side of life and sitting very, you know, <laughs> up front and this guy, you know, he went crazy throwing water into the audience and blowing his horn right in people's faces with a jazz quartet and, uh, you know, running into the audience and just playing his horn right in front of people. And that was, and I, I thought people were going to, you know, be reacting against it and, and people were loving it. So it's it's been interesting to me. I've seen just through being in different um, performance experiences where you see people that you think there's no way these people are going to like this. They don't know what kind of concert they're in for. And sometimes those people know exactly what they're in for or they like, you know, it might be um, no matter what your age is, some people just never stop wanting to be challenged and shocked. So um, 
it's interesting. I mean, our shows have a huge mix of people in them. You, you do get people that you would think aren't going to like it, and they, but they do. And uh, you get younger people, and you get, you know, pretty mixed bag. It's not your typical chamber music audience by any means, usually. Oftentimes, you get to play with musicians that you've played with before. You know, every, you know, there's always a mixed bag, half and half. And you're always playing with people that you haven't played before that you'd want to play with. Uh, it's it's the one time a year during the season you, it does, that doesn't happen that often. You know, but in the summer, it's almost fully dedicated to creating music that week or making making it work that week. Um, and oftentimes with I mean, especially places like here in Santa Fe, um, quality of musicians pretty high for the most part, uh, which is not always the case. But uh, you know, uh, yeah, you can pull things together quickly. Yeah, you're working and with people. Yeah, it's have, fun. You know, most of the, most of our shows we play, it's just the three of us. So it's it's nice to be at a festival, and sometimes we've been able to uh, collaborate with other musicians in the festival. Um, you know, three of us plus them, whatever. Like Dave was talking about some open form pieces earlier that we sometimes bring along, um, just because that's a great way to interact with people in different places you play, other musicians, and do it in a way where you, you know, if you only have 45 minutes to get something together, it's, you know, something you can still pull off, make worth people's time listening to, and uh, give you a chance to, you know, um, work with people in the different communities you go around to, the different festivals, whatever it may be? Well, I think summer festivals, um, um, people might be uh, vacationing a little bit more, like Andrew's saying, you're Not in really nice, here, nice towns or whatever, or, or I mean, people are, I mean, it's just seasonally people act a little bit different in the summer, so, uh, yeah. you know, but it's, I don't find like a big, big difference, you know. Well, um, it's different in the sense that it's just I think it is more of a difference in the different towns you play in than it is between, say, a regular concert on a series and a, and a festival. Um, yeah, especially also venues. Sometimes we play in venues that are closer to like a you know a rock club almost, and that's maybe all, probably the environment where our music ultimately, or at least some of it, uh, is more suited to. Um, or just being amplified. And then or, yeah, you know. and having more of that kind of black box element, you know. Instead of like a concert hall and people more elegantly dressed, you know, it's, uh, so, you know, a couple of pieces we have fit into those atmospheres. But even when we play festivals, we tend to be kind of used in a way like as a contemporary music concert or, um, you know, a couple of times we've been programmed in a way where we were put on stage, you know, with other pieces that were probably more what people were coming to see, like, you know, big piano trio, big string quartet, something like that. And that's one way you can program your music is put it next to something that other people will come to and then they get to hear the contemporary music as well. Um, but if you put it by itself, you're going to tend to get just the people that are attracted to, to that and that's definitely a different audience. I mean, I've known Jimmy since, I've seen him grow up. <laughs> I've known Jimmy since I was a teenager. Worked with him. He has this, he, because he is such a, first, firstly, a great violinist and musician, he, he knows, he has a respect of, of all musicians that are in this world. So I think he's, he's in this position. David Finkel and Wuhan were also in a similar position when they were also Heichiro Oyama when he was running Summerfest. They all were great musicians who had played with the greatest musicians playing today. So I think it's not like, uh, I mean, he could basically pick up the phone and have anybody here that he wants. And I, I, I think that's rare amongst, uh, amongst people that are running a festival such as Summerfest. You know, I think it's, it tends to be easier for him because he has, he has that respect for, from his colleagues. And people want to come and play at his festival and play with him. And you know, um, yeah, I think he's a perfect fit for for Summerfest. Yeah. Despite the fact that he's a Yankee fan. Yeah.